All right, let's get started. Um, today we're going to continue our discussion of international trade. I want to finish up uh, discussing comparative advantage, and then we'll talk about the welfare implications of economic of international trade, and then how that drives our thinking about trade policy, one of the hottest topics in economics discussions today. So let's finish our discussion of comparative advantage that we started last time. Um, remember, the key lesson from the PPF type analysis we did last time is that if there's comparative advantage, it can yield gains to trade through specialization. So that's sort of the key lesson, is that comparative advantage yields gains from trade through the mechanism of specialization. OK? So basically, comparative advantage, because of, because of comparative advantage, you can specialize. And that means you can essentially get an outward bending PPF. You can essentially get economies of scope by specializing and then sort of combining your activities. Now, you're not literally getting economies of scope because each person's doing their own thing. But it acts as if the economy as a whole is yielding economies of scope. Because basically, by specializing, you're allowing the economy as a whole to benefit from people doing what they're best at. So that's the basic intuition of the sort of economics of why international trade can yield gains. Okay? Now, that raised the natural question of, well, where does comparative advantage come from? Why do some places have, why do some countries have comparative advantage? We know where it comes from, me versus LeBron James. He's got better genes and he's worked harder than I have. But basically, when it comes to countries, how does, um, where does comparative advantage come from? And basically comes from, roughly speaking, two sources. The first source of comparative advantage is factor endowments. Some countries, just through the nature of geography and geological history, are endowed with, with things that people want. And therefore, it gives a comparative advantage in trading those things. So if you think about Canada, um, Canada is endowed with enormous amounts of forested land. And they've become a major exporter of uh, lumber and paper products over time. That's their comparative advantage because they happen to have all this forested land around. Um, so for example, that's why most clothing today comes from China and less developed countries. Because their, their factor endowment is cheap labor. Okay? It's not that they have more natural textile threads or whatever. It's just they, they, have, they have a cheap labor, which is the, cheap, the primary factor which goes into producing textiles. So one source of, tech of comparative advantage is factor endowments. Now once again, some country could have more of everything. Canada could have cheap labor and lumber. But the key point is in the simple sort of two by two world we're thinking of, it's all about relative, comparative advantage. So it's the one they have the most of relative to other countries. OK? And the second source of comparative advantage, the second reason why some countries have comparative advantage, is technology. So if you look at Japan and cars, there's no, Japan has no comparative advantage of producing cars. It's not like they have more of the raw products that make steel than, say, the US does. The difference is that Japan was a leader in developing technology of the modern automobile. And that technological boost gave the comparative advantage. So factor endowments are kind of natural. Technology is a sort of created source of comparative advantage that essentially, by developing the technology, you give yourself really sort of a first mover advantage and are able to then um, ha have leadership, have the relative comparative advantage in producing that good. That's why, in some sense, it becomes technology policy really becomes trade policy. And we'll talk about that uh, at the end of the lecture when we talk about trade policy in the US. OK? So that's really all I just want to finish up on comparative advantage. The main thing is the intuition we developed last time. But I just want to highlight also what it means, what comparative advantage means, and where it comes from. What I really want to focus on today is the welfare implications of international trade and why economists are such big fans of international trade. So the welfare, welfare in trade, and why do economists in simple diagrammatic form so uh, such strong proponents of uh, free international trade? OK? So to consider that, let's go back to our example of roses and look at figure 19.1. OK? We have here a simple representation of the domestic market for roses. Okay, you've got a supply curve, 
and a demand curve, and you yield your consumer and producer surplus. Okay, so let's say this is for the U.S. You've got U.S. supply of roses, U.S. demand for roses, consumer and producer surplus. Now let's ask, what happens once we allow international trade? Once we allow for the importation or exportation of roses? Let's go to the next figure, which is pretty complicated, so let's walk through it. Okay. Now we're looking at the rose market with imports. Okay. Now, the presence of imports in imports don't act, doesn't actually change the nature of demand and supply. So the domestic or US demand and supply curves are not shifted. What imports do is effectively increase the supply curve of roses available to US consumers by adding roses from other countries. Okay? So what we do is to make this work, what we basically, the, tr the trick we use in these models is we essentially assume that in international markets, there's a perfectly elastic supply of the good. So what we say is international trade creates a perfectly elastic supply of rose at the price P sub W. That is the price used to be P sub A for autarky. That's the price where domestic supply hit domestic demand. We're going to assume that what international trade does is lower the price to P sub W and make supply perfectly elastic. That is, the US can get as many roads as it wants at a price P sub W. Now, for a small country, this sort of makes sense, right? For a small country, the, essentially, they're like a small producer in a perfectly competitive market. For the US, it might not make so much sense. The US is sort of kind of big enough that it's hard to imagine that we're sort of price takers with respect to anything. We're the US. We don't take any prices. Uh, but for, in principle, the basic intuition we get from this model works. So we're just going to sort of treat US as a small, small country for these purposes. So and for something like rose, it's probably not bad to think of the US as a price taker in the rose market. Okay? So it's a bit of a cheat to say the US faces perfectly elastic supply in the world market, but it's not a bad cheat, and it doesn't, and it doesn't uh, hurt the important intuitions will derive. So we're going to assume the US faces a perfectly elastic world supply at price P sub W. Now, what, we, what does this do? What this does is suddenly, at that lower price P sub W, consumers now want C sub T. They want a lot more roses, because the price has fallen, demand's downward sloping. But domestic producers want to produce a lot fewer roses. Since marginal cost is upward sloping, if you're going to force the price down a piece of W, they don't want to produce as many roses. They only want to produce Q sub T. How do you resolve this? You resolve this through imports. That the difference between Q sub T and C sub T is imports. So the total amount of roses consumed does rise from Q sub A to C sub T. The total amount of roses consumed does rise. But the amount produced domestically falls. So both things are happening. Both US consumers are consuming more roses, and US producers are producing fewer roses. And the gap is made up by imports. OK, kind of a complicated diagram. Are there questions about this? Because I'm going to build on this diagram going forward. Any questions about how this works? OK, now let's ask, what are the welfare implications? Let's go to figure 19.3. What are the welfare implications of international trade? Well, the welfare implications are for consumers, their surplus used to be um, their surplus used to be W. They used to get Q sub A roses at a price P sub A. So their surplus used to be the area W. What is the surplus of domestic consumers? Let me an important point for welfare. We're going to look at domestic. Welfare only. We'll come back later to caring about the rest of the world. But for now, we only care about the US. So when I talk about welfare, unless I say otherwise, I'm thinking about US welfare only, US consumers, US producers. Very important to keep in mind, because otherwise, this can get confusing. So for now, I'm talking about domestic welfare only. So for US consumers, what has happened? They used to get a surplus of W. What's their surplus now? Yeah. Yes. Z, by the way, is the entire sort of light purple area. It's, hard, it's confusing because there's this dotted line down the middle. Z is either side of the dotted line. The entire triangle is Z. So consumers now get W plus X plus C. Why? Because they're consuming C sub T at a price P sub W. 
Okay, don't let the other complication in the graph confuse you. Remember, consumer surplus is just the area below the demand curve, above the price, at the equilibrium quantity. The new equilibrium quantity consumed is C sub T. The new price is P sub W, so they get that giant triangle. Producers used to have a surplus of X plus Z. X plus Y, I'm sorry. Producers used to sell Q sub A at a price P sub A. So the area above the supply curve, below the price, was X plus Y. Now X has been transferred to consumers. So producer surplus has fallen to Y. So what's happened? Well, it's the opposite of the kind of deadweight loss diagrams we saw before. When we did things like impose a tax, we transferred from one group to another, creating deadweight loss. International trade is the opposite effect. We've transferred from one group to another and created social gain for the US. US consumers have gained. They've, and on net, US society is better off by the area Z. And this, in the terms of this course, is why economists like international trade. That expands the opportunity set by allowing consumers to get these cheaper goods, you raise consumer surplus more than you lower producer surplus. And that's why we like international trade. It's a net win for society. Now, different parties might feel differently about it, and we'll come back to that. But let's just focus right now on total social surplus. And for total social surplus, which are defined as producer plus consumers, we are better off. Okay, and that's why we like international trade. Okay? Question about that. Yeah. The new price surplus is just y. It used to be y plus x, so producers are losing x. Consumers gain that x, but consumers also get z. So it's sort of the flip side of the deadweight loss we talked about before. You're transferring from producers to consumers, but you're also creating new gains for consumers along the way. OK? OK, so now that's imports. What about exports? Let's flip and think about computers. Let's go to figure 19.4 and talk about computers. For computers, once again, we start at point A. We start with computers under autarky without trading. The price is where demand equals supply at P sub A, and the quantity is Q sub A. And that's the initial equilibrium for computers. Now we open up to trade. Well, what happens now is now the rest of the world wants US computers, so the US can sell at a higher price. Before, the US could only sell to domestic consumers. But now, they can, their demand for their goods worldwide, we don't show world demand here. But world demand is way above US demand. Okay, If you flip back to 19.3, the reason that that piece of W line is below the piece of A is that world supply, or 19.2 is easier, world supply is, below, is above US supply. Since supply is higher, the price falls. Now, in 19.4, world demand is higher than US demand, so the price rises. So we end up with a piece of W at the higher level. What does this mean? Well, the higher piece of W, domestic consumers want fewer computers. They used to be able to buy computers a piece of A. Now they have to pay a piece of W because they're competing with consumers around the world. Okay? They have to pay more. So they want fewer computers. Their demand for computers falls from QA to CT. What about domestic producers? Well, now they're getting a higher price, so they want to make more computers. So their production rises from QA to QT. So you now have consumers consuming much less than producers are making. So the producers send the rest abroad, and that's exports. OK? So we have the flip side. Before we had under, in figure 19.2, if you flip back and forth, in figure 19.2, we had consumers wanting more than producers domestically willing to make. So you had imports. Now we have consumer, domestic consumers wanting less than domestic producer willing to make. So you have exports. What are the welfare implications? Go to 19.5. Now what you get is consumers are worse off. They used to have a consumer surplus of W plus X, where X is the entire dotted area. Now the consumer surplus has fallen to just W. Remember, we're doing domestic consumers only. There's some people in Columbia who got computers. They're happy. We're ignoring them. We're just doing US consumers. Okay? They used to get W plus X. 
Now they only get W, below the demand curve, above the new price. But producers who used to get Y now get Y plus X plus Z. So you've transferred X from domestic consumers, domestic producers, but you've also given domestic producers this extra bit Z. So once again, surplus has gone up. So this is the crazy thing about trade. Imports raise welfare and exports raise welfare. Either way, whether the goods are coming in or the goods are going out, society as a whole is better off. Why? Because of comparative advantage. Because we're better off as a world when we can share our goods across nations. Because we can then rely on the more efficient producers, lowering the prices for roses in places like the US, and raise the lowering the prices for goods US consumes, and raising the price for goods US produces. And same with every other country. It's literally a win-win. Every country, by the end of specialize, gets to see lower prices in the goods they weren't good at making, okay, and higher prices in the goods they are good at making. So there's transfers across producers and consumers, but overall, uh, welfare goes up. Okay? So basically, this is the bottom line. This, so these two graphs are kind of why economists unambiguously, traditionally, traditionally kind of something basically like free trade. Until you get into subtleties like caring about producers versus consumers separately. Basically, the logic of last time, which is a comparative advantage allows specialization, means that by trading, we can allow countries to specialize and thereby getting higher prices for the things they send abroad and lower prices for the things they bring in from abroad. Okay? Questions about that? Okay. And we can see from this why the notion of sort of a trade deficit, something we should care about, is sort of ridiculous. Because basically, it's all just about your endowments. Okay, at the end of the day, you want to sell stuff that you're in you have a comparative advantage in and import stuff you don't have a comparative advantage in. If the rest of the world has more comparative advantage than you, then you want to import more than you export. Doesn't mean you're worse off. It just means your consumers are benefiting from the fact the rest of the world is good at making stuff like sweaters. So that segues us naturally to our important policy discussion and sort of the main focus, one of the main focus of public policy today, which is trade policy. How do we take this framework and apply it to thinking about government policy over international trade? And that's what I spend the rest of today talking about. So let me just ask before we go there, any questions about the economics here before we start talking about policy? OK. Now, trade, let's start once again with trade policy with sort of the standard economics view, OK? Which is that you'll often hear people say, well, imports are a job killer. And in some sense, they're right. That's what figure 19.3 is showing. Producers are the ones with the jobs. Producer surplus is falling. So there's less profitability in the corporate sector, so there may, may be less jobs there. OK? Now, many people say we should react to that by imposing restrictions on imports. They say, look, exports are great, but what about imports? They're killing jobs. Why don't we restrict those? And there's two fundamental forms of restrictions on imports. There's quotas, which is literally a limit on how much of a certain good you can import. Those aren't used so much anymore. The more typical form of, international, of, of import deterrence is tariffs. OK, is tariffs. OK? And basically, what these are are taxes that are levied only on imports. A tariff is just a name for a tax that only applies to imports. Okay, that's what a tariff is. It's a, it's a certain kind of tax that only applies to imports. Okay? So we could, for example, levy a tariff on roses coming in from Colombia. If we levy that tariff, making roses expensive enough, then folks might go buy to, back to buying them from the US producers and we can reopen those greenhouses and the jobs that come with them. That is true. What that misses is the fact that US consumers then suffer from paying higher prices for roses. And on net, we're worse off as a result. To see that, let's go to figure 19.6. Okay? So basically, what figure 19.6 does is we now start from the position 
of being in inter international trading. So before the other figures, we started from autarky and added trade. Now I want to start from position with trade and add a tariff. So our initial equilibrium is at P sub W with consumers consuming C1, producers producing Q1, and initial level of imports denoted by imports before tariff. Okay, that's where we start. What the tariff does is essentially raise the price back up. Now, I can't raise the price above the domestic price, because if the tariff's big enough, you just go back to buying what you want for domestic producers. But it raises it back towards the domestic price. So let's say, for example, the tariff is high enough that the international, that the world price, the price paid in the US rises from PW to PT, the gap being the amount of the tax. So with untaxed trade, the US would pay PW for roses. Now, when we tax trade, that price goes up to P sub T. OK? So now let's ask, what does that do to the market? Well, it's pretty straightforward. You just say, well, what is demand and supply at that new price? Well, at that new price, there's lower demand for roses. So rose demand falls from C1 to C2. There's more domestic production of roses. So domestic production rises from Q1 to Q2. And the imports after the tariff shrink massively. The tariff had its desired effect. It shrunk imports. But what does this do to welfare? Let's go to figure 19.7. Now, now we can just compare this area between the two horizontal lines. We used to be at the bottom horizontal line, now we're at the higher one. A, the area A, is the new producer surplus. Producers used to get the area, that low triangle below area A. We used to call it Y. Now they've added A. Producers have now added a new producer surplus A. But consumers have lost A, B, C, and D. That entire area is lost to consumers. Yeah? Does this make a comparison to when there was a... Uh, yeah, that's what I said. Comparison where there was when there was free trade, no tariff. So it's a comparison to the second situation in figure 19.3. Uh, 19, so 19.3, and this is confusing. I'm sorry about that, but it's too hard to put it all in one graph. 19.3 is what happens when we move from no trade to free trade. 19.7, 6 and 7, are moving from free trade to free trade with the tariff. Okay. By the way, if the tariff was brought us exactly back to the no trade situation, just be the flip of the previous diagram, which makes it a little more interesting by making the tariff somewhat lower than that. So what's happened to consumer surplus? Well, look at this way. Remember consumer surplus. It's the area below the demand curve above the price. So it used to be a huge triangle. Now what's happened is fall, fallen by the entire trapezoid A, B, C, D. Can folks see that? Look at the new consumer. Don't ignore the fact it's four different areas. Just think of it as one trapezoid. The new consumer surplus, the area under the demand curve ab above PT. The old consumer surplus, the area under the demand curve above PW. That's followed by the trapezoid ABCD. Now, why do we split that into four pieces? Well, first of all, because A is gained by producers. So we want to call that out. That's not a net loss in welfare. There's also the area C, the green area C. C is also a gain. What is C? That's the government revenue from the tariffs. Okay, the government's gained something from the, we've, we get tax revenue. Okay, we could give that back to consumers if we want. So that's not lost surplus. The tax revenue is exactly the amount of new imports times the tariff. So it's complicated. It's not, now we have this third player, which is the government. It used to be just either producer, or consumer, or, or, or society. Now we have this third player, which is the government. So the deadweight loss from the tariff is B plus D. What we've lost is B plus D. So let me go through the math again. Consumers lost A plus B plus C plus D. Producers gained A, and the government gained C. So the net loss from the tariff is B plus D. OK, it's sort of hard, but do people see that? And that's why economists don't like tariffs. Because the amount producers gain plus the amount the government raises is much less than what consumers lose. Yeah, we've created some jobs growing roses. Yeah, we've gotten a little tax revenue. 
but we've really screwed producers who now have to pay much higher prices for their roses. And if you add that up, it's worse. Why is it worse? Because you're taking less advantage of specialization comparative advantage by forcing us away from the most efficient point. The most efficient point is where we can take, everyone can specialize. You force that away. You put the US, which shouldn't be growing roses, back in the business of growing roses. And Colombia, which should be growing roses, gets out of that business. Yeah? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. I am not expert on the actual logistics, but roughly speaking, when it comes into the US, into customs, so any goods shipped in the US for sale into customs, at that point, there is a tax levied on it. Now, I don't know logistically who gets the bill. Does the exporting company get the bill or the importing company get the bill? Um, when we talk about taxes, I'll show you it doesn't matter who gets the bill. It's the same either way. OK, so hold that thought. But that's basically what happens. Good question. OK, so with that in mind, OK, so that is the fundamental reason, in graphical terms, why economists don't like tariffs. But that's not the only reason. In fact, there's two other reasons that aren't even in this graph why tariffs and restrictions on trade policy more generally are bad. The other reason is that they cause trade wars. OK, so let's say that, um, let's say we impose this tariff on Colombian roses. Well, Colombia, we like, screw you. If you're going to tax our roses, we're taxing your computers. Well, what would happen if there was a tariff that Colombia placed on our computers? Well, I don't have that figure, but you should be able to show yourself that that is exactly the opposite effect. It raises US consumer surplus, because now computers are cheaper in the US because we can't sell them in Colombia. But it lowers our welfare, and now we don't get the government revenues. Colombia does. So we lose almost all the trapezoid in that case. If you flip this around, we would get a small rise in consumer surplus, but a huge loss of producer surplus, and we wouldn't even get the government revenues to make it up. So that's really bad for us. And of course, it's a natural response. Why wouldn't Columbia do it? OK? So this, this first problem is this understates, yes, we might create some jobs in roses, but we're going to destroy jobs in computers. Because we're not going to sell as many computers as we used to. So it's not even job creating. OK? This, once you take into the fact that other countries retaliate, in fact, we make consumers worse off and producers worse off. Because we make the price for roses much higher, and we lose jobs in the computer sector. Yeah? Is there a way to like, diplomatically eliminate this if you're like a world monopoly? I feel like a world monopoly. Uh, so basically, one way to do it is to come to trade deals where you essentially, you essentially cartelize countries. So this is much, if you can think of this in very parallel ways to a non-cooperative oligopoly. If you can cooperate, what do you do? You just get to free trade. And that, we'll talk about trade deals in a few minutes. That's essentially what those are doing. Yeah? Uh, why are current economic advisors and government So, so let me get to that. OK, so basically, um, what we've done, and this, let me ask the first question, basically. What we've done is, because of the arguments I've made here, over time, we've created essentially cooperative oligopolies around the world. Pro the one you've heard a lot is, uh, uh, OK, so I'm sorry, trade wars is the first reason. Let me get to the second reason. The second reason is that actually, as decent human beings, we might care about people in other countries, too. OK, and the fact is that there's when you these both import restrictions and trade wars hurt other countries just like they hurt us. It's not only are we worse off, but other countries are worse off. Even without the trade war, we've made ourselves worse off, and we've hurt Colombia because they can't sell our rose, their roses to the US. So the other reason we don't like, so the other reason besides this figure is that basically if we if we place any weight at all on the utility of people outside the US, which we should, okay, it's bad as well. Now, I'm not saying you have to weigh to Colombian, the, uh, Colombian's welfare the same as US welfare. But as long as it's non-zero, then that's the second reason to oppose it. And that's why there's been a huge growth in agreements, the most famous of which we, we've heard of is NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, signed in the early 1990s under President Clinton, which essentially set up a cooperative oligopoly between the US, Mexico, and Canada. So I just said, let's just get rid of these trade barriers so we can have freer trade within, within our regimes. OK? And basically, um, but 
this was, uh, this was actually you know, quite popular at the time. Economists liked it. But it's become very unpopular over time, was opposed by President Trump. And in fact, he recently ripped up NAFTA, although he replaced it with something that's pretty much the same, uh, just renamed it as USMCA. Uh, so why are people, you know, why are people so opposed to free trade? It's a great question. Why are Trump's advisors? Why, in fact, are the majority, uh, the majority of Americans, if any, ask the question, don't like free trade? You know, it depends how you ask the question. But it's certainly not universally popular, like I said it should be. So what's going on? OK? Well, there's really a couple things going on. The first is that we can't, we don't, I wouldn't say can't, we don't compensate the losers. This is the most important part. We don't compensate the losers. What do I mean by that? Let's go back to figure 19, uh, 3. What's happened? We've put in international trade. Producers have lost X. Consumers have gained, have gained X and Z. So it's a simple economic policy. If we did international trade and then just took X and gave it back to producers, no one would be sadder. If we give producers a little more than X, what if we did international trade and gave producers X plus 20% of, of Z? Then everybody wins. That's the kind of argument. The problem is we don't do that. All we do is let consumers have these super cheap sweaters. So I get to go buy this incredibly cheap sweater, and people in North Carolina's livelihoods are destroyed. Okay? We don't compensate the losers. And the winners don't notice they're paying $5 or $10 less for a sweater. But the looters, losers notice they don't have a job. So the problem is, yes, there's more winning. But first of all, it's winning among many more people by a small amount. Whereas losing is by fewer people by a large amount. And that always gets more political attention. And we don't have mechanisms in place or don't put in. Not we, I started right can't, but it's not can't. We could. We could easily address this. There'd be a simple policy. What if we simply said there'll be a tax on, there'll be a tax on all consumers of international, uh, on all, uh, just a tax on consumers, not of international goods. That would be like a tariff. But just a general tax on consumers of consumer goods that tend to come in international trade. So we'd say, you know, tax on clothes. And we'll take all that money and we'll redistribute it to people who lost their jobs in the textile sector, help retrain them for new jobs, or help pay their bills while they find a new job. Then we could literally deliver some of X and even maybe some of Z to the producers. But we don't do that. And that's the main reason to answer your question why there's opposition to free trade is because people see the, uh, see the cost, they don't see the benefits. And well-off people like me who don't need, who could happily afford to pay twice as much for a sweater, we just get these benefits we don't even pay attention to. Whereas you know, typically lower income workers, because they're competing with lower income countries, lose their jobs and, and, uh, and they notice it. Okay, So that's one big reason. The other big reason is that there can be socially damaging routes Routes to comparative advantage. There can be socially, that sounds like socially damaging routes to California. Socially damaging routes to comparative advantage. That is, there can be ways that countries get to comparative advantage that are not so happy. So why does China have low labor costs? Partly because they got a billion and a half people to work. But partly because workers are massively exploited there. Work conditions are terrible. And it's a horrible life being a worker in a Chinese factory. Moreover, there's terrible environmental conditions imposed by Chinese production. In the US, we have restrictions that try to minimize, in some ways, the environmental damage done by our production. They don't have those in China or India. India is home to you know, like three of the top five polluted cities in the world. Okay, They don't have those. So by creating their comparative advantage, they may be doing damage that we don't like. Just, just like we care about the fact that consumers, we care about other countries' welfare, well, we might also care about the fact that, th that this, free, this free trade is hurting other countries' welfare. So a great example, I've got a great example, a very relevant example, was a recent story about lead poisoning in China. Um, there was this battery factory, you know, batteries are big business now, um, that made lead acid batteries for motorcycles and electric parks, electric bikes. 
and basically they operate in a flagrant violation of law, environmental law. They would just dump the mercury and stuff they were using like in the rivers and lakes all around. Flagrant, everybody knew it. Uh, and 233 adults and 99 children were found that blood, lead in their bloods up to seven times the safe amount. And they're basically going to be, you know, lives will be destroyed by this. Okay? And this is a big issue in the negotiation of NAFTA. And a big reason a lot of people on the left don't like international trade is because they fear for the welfare of people who are being affected. So in NAFTA, when it was negotiated in the early 90s, there were some protections for workers. There were some protections. Basically, the idea was Mexico, if you want to sign this, you got to put in some protections to sort of raise the standard of living your worker and improve your environment. So once again, um, there are ways to deal with this by, put, by saying, look, free trade, where we impose some restrictions, is still better than no free trade. So we might go in and say, look, once again, it's all about how you spend Z. Okay? You got a bunch of money to spend. How are you going to spend it? Some of the way you can spend it is by compensating the producers. Another way you can spend it is by saying, look, we'll be willing to make it all smaller, have the world price be a little bit higher, but make sure you have decent environmental conditions and decent wages for your workers. As long as we don't impose too high restrictions, we can still all gain. Okay? So that's another reason people don't like international trade. On the other hand, we taught, we taught the story of the child workers in Vietnam and how free trade and rice were, was better for them because the parents got richer and had them work less and put them in school. So it's not clear which way this goes, but that's certainly another concern. Okay? And then finally, there's the issue which is, I think, paramount in this administration, which is trade policy, trade policy as a tool of foreign policy. Trade policy tool of foreign policy. Look, consider where we are with China today. Okay? There's a host of reasons to be angry with China. Now, some are irrational. The Trump's administration obsession with trade deficits, that I've explained repeatedly, is irrational. Okay? It's the Pikachu fallacy. Okay? But some of it's rational. Okay? China, we operate under something called the World Trading Organization. Once again, coming to the other question, it's another chance to try to kind of cartelize the country and set a, cartelize the world and set a fair a set of fair trading rules, the World Trading Organization. China repeatedly violates the rules set up by the World Trading Organization. For example, under those rules, China should allow free, much freer tr uh, sales of US goods in China. But they sort of implicitly restrict them. Not, not on paper, but in practice. They set up lots of practices, which makes it harder to set up, sell US goods. They also do a lot of significant industrial espionage and, uh, espionage and stealing our industrial secrets. So what we want to do that, for example, is China has a rule that you cannot have a solely owned subsidiary in China. If you own a subsidiary in China, it has to be jointly owned with a Chinese company, which then will promptly take the ideas and pass them on and kick you out of the country. Okay? So China is engaging some nasty practices which are bad for the US, which are certainly bad, they may be good for China, they're certainly bad for US self-interest. And that's true. That is unambiguously true. The question is, what's the right response? And the Trump administration argues the right response is tariffs. The right response is to punish China through tariffs for their bad behavior. And economists, virtually all economists, say that's the wrong response. There is literally less than 1% of economists who believe, who, who agree with this policy. Just a few of them happen to work in the Trump administration. But basically, at the end of the day, basically, virtually all economists agree it's a bad idea. And that's for three reasons. The first reason is our standard reason that we think trade is good. We think we're hurting ourselves. By imposing tariffs on Chinese goods, all we do is hurting ourselves. We're making people pay more for stuff. Why would we want to do that? Moreover, we're causing a trade war. China's now imposing tariffs on our goods, which hurts our producers. So our farmers, for example, um, are going to suffer because it'll be harder to sell our farm goods in China because of the new tariffs they've imposed. So the standard arguments we have here still hold. We like free trade because it expands opportunities. And if we try to limit it, other countries will respond in a way which further restrict opportunities. So that's the standard reason economists are mad about this. Okay. The second reason is it's sort of hard to do this. It's hard to use trade policy tool of foreign policy because it's not even clear what's made in China and what's made in America anymore. So if we build the car in America, but the parts are made in China, is it an American car or a Chinese car? 
Oftentimes, we'll have things which are shipped to China back to America and then back to China, or vice versa. So it's not even clear what's a Chinese import or export and what's US import or export. These are, these are blurry lines now. Now, once again, that's all because of the efficiency of production. Basically, what we've done over time is we sort of micro, we sort of uh, disaggregated production to more and more efficient components. It used to be one guy made the whole car. Now we recognize there's certain parts that are made more efficiently in China, certain parts made more efficiently in Cambodia, more efficiently in the US, more efficiently in Germany, and we put them together. What that does is it makes international trade super messy to understand. But it makes the world better off. It's just further increasing comparative advantage of specialization. But it makes it harder to decide what's a Chinese good and what's a US good. So that's the second problem. And the third, and probably the single most important criticism economists make, is this is a really silly thing to do by yourself. The US is big, but we still represent a minority of Chinese exports. OK, we represent a large share, but still a minority. As long as China can still sell to other people, OK, and they're making plenty of money off their practices against us, they might not stop. Now, they're, they prefer to sell to us. But if you think, on the one hand, they're making a ton of money ripping us off. On the other hand, they'll still get to sell 70 80% as much as the rest of the world once they adjust things. Then maybe they'll be like, fine, we're happy to let you do that. You're just cutting off your nose to spite your face. But if we get the whole world to coordinate and say, you violated the norms of the World Trading Organization, we're now all going to set up trade restrictions on China. Then they feel the pain. So the other reason economists oppose this is moving unilaterally on trade just doesn't make sense. Okay, if you want to try to get to deal with these problems, you need to do it through a coordinated response. Okay? Now, let me be very clear. This is a very, very hard issue. Okay? Economists try to make it very simple with our surplus diagrams and stuff like that, but it's a super hard issue. Okay? Nonetheless, it's an issue where your bias in thinking about it should be towards the basic bias of economics which is if we can expand opportunity sets, that's a good thing. And the real challenge is twofold. How do we expand opportunity sets in a fair way? And two, how do we deal with compensating the losers as opportunity sets advance? And this is something we'll spend a lot of time on after Thanksgiving. It's how we redistribute in society from one group to another. OK, now let me get some questions. I know this is sort of a top field folk. Yeah. So um, there is, uh, like, it. On, on, on like the international level, um, when a country like China is about these, sometimes the UN will suggest that like sanctions are imposed uh, against that country. And I was wondering if you know anything about how that tends to work in terms of welfare. Like, does like do the sanctions tend to make the country behave better, and then like like ultimately the world is better off, or are those also like a bad idea? That's a really interesting question. I so if, let's think about sanctions in this framework. So sanctions, let's say. One sanction would be, you know, it depends on the form of the sanctions, depends, et cetera. So one sanction would be literally you have to pay a bunch of money. Well, then that's just like a tax on the country. We just think about that. Think of the country individual. They're worse off. The UN gets some money. In some sense, it depends on whether the sanction works or not. So that's sort of the easy case is just simply the trade off of do you encourage the behavior you want to encourage versus what pain do you impose on the country? And how do you trade those two things off? If they're a really bad acting country, you might not care you're imposing pain on them. As long as there's some chance you get the change of behavior you want, you're happy. But what if the sanction is limiting trade? Well, then you're hurting other countries too. Then it becomes a bit trickier. So then, once again, the trade off is three piece. I hurt the country I want to hurt. But I hurt countries I don't want to hurt. But I also may get a change of behavior I want. So you have to wait. You have to add those three pieces and put them together. How do you put them together? That's exactly what we'll talk about after Thanksgiving. You put them together by thinking about a waiting function, which we call a social welfare function which weights the well-being of all these different parties and puts them together. OK? A very related issue we haven't talked about. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so do you think that the current administration is putting in these policies to try and like, rise, like, gain popularity because so many people misunderstand trade? You know, I, I, don't, I think there's almost no one who makes any money by, by, under, by trying to understand what's in the mind of the current administration. So I, I have no idea. Um, I think China is engaging in bad practices, but I also think it's good politics, and it's hard to know what, what, what's the mix. But this actually relate, come, to the current administration, it's raised another issue that's related to all this, which we haven't talked about, which is what about immigration? 
another, you know, <laughs> I'm going to stop before I get to abortion. Okay? Let, what, about, what, about, what about immigration? Okay? Well, immigration, actually, the framework is very much the same. If, if there are people who can contribute to our society by coming here, then we are better off by letting them in. By the same logic of specialization comparative advantage. If there are people, for example, let's say US folks don't want to pick our crops and we don't want to clean toilets. But picking crops and cleaning toilets at a low wage is a terrific opportunity for someone from another country. Then we could be better off by letting them in. Okay? Or let's say, as has turned out to be the true historically, the kind of person who wants to take the risk to immigrate to America is the kind of person who often becomes an entrepreneur and thinks up new ideas. Much of the entrepreneurial ideas in America have come from our nation's history of immigrants. Because who picks up and leaves? It's kind of a risky thing to do, right? To pick up, leave your home, and leave and come to this unknown place. And those sort of risk-loving people are often the kind of people who sort of think up new ideas and want to start new businesses. So for that reason, immigration has traditionally been an enormous benefit to the US economy. And I think today the general consensus, this is more controversial than free trade, but I think the general consensus among economists is that immigration on net is good for the country. But there's redistributional consequences. It's good for rich people because they get low paid people to pick their fruits and do their lawn work. But it's bad for people who used to pick the fruits and do the lawn work. So once again, if we could figure out a way to compensate the losers, immigration is probably on that good. Now it's more complicated. When we import a car, it doesn't get welfare or commit crimes. Immigrants might get on welfare or commit crimes, so it's more complicated than just free trade. So what you have to do in that case is you have to look at the evidence. Okay? And the evidence is that immigrants commit crime at a much lower rate than comparable US citizens and collect welfare at a much lower rate than comparable US citizens. So you can't compare an immigrant to me. An immigrant is more likely to commit crime or collect welfare than I am, but an immigrant is also less educated than I am. That I'm not the comparable person. Compare an immigrant to the person, they're sort of replacing the labor market, a low-skilled US citizen. Okay? Immigrants are less likely to collect welfare and less likely to commit crimes than are those people. So as a result, those arguments don't really bode well for restricting immigration. On the other hand, I think there's very few people who say we should have a totally porous and open border, okay? Because of illegal movement of goods and because there are, we don't, we don't want pe people who are objectively criminal in other countries. They're also risk-loving. We don't necessarily want them here. So I think this is a hard issue. Unlike international trade, where I think economists would say just more is good, I think that immigration, there are some difficult trade-offs because people come with a set of baggage that goods don't come with. Uh, but I think economists would generally say a lot of the same arguments apply. We, just need a, we might need a more uh, comprehensive policy than we have when it comes to trading goods. 